from Taipei, Taiwan. Welcome to another video. And it's a continuation of uh, the topic that we've been talking about for the past few weeks since the beginning of the year, actually, where I was talking about the importance of understanding how to get how to learn from different sources. And before that, we were looking at uh, resources that were leading more on the concept conceptual side, as opposed to just taking leaks here and there. Today we're going to look at the other side. We're, we're going to still look at concepts, but we're also going to take licks. And just before we start, the usual, a little bit of advertisement. If you like what I do, please like, please subscribe, please leave a comment. It's one of my only sources of income right now and really make a huge difference if you could just even click the like button or leave a simple comment. I think the, the YouTube algorithm has changed recently, so it's a lot harder these days. Um, if you want to support me, you can buy something on Sound Slice or on DC Music School. You'll find all the links in the description box. Um, namely, the, there are two courses that I'm that are kind of related to what we're talking about here. There's the Bebop um, course, Bebop Licks, How to Build Bebop Vocabulary. Uh, and there's also a course on Harmony, uh, Practical Harmony, because we're going to be talking about this today. As you see in the title, it seems controversial, but it's not. What is jazz anyway? Because nowadays jazz can mean a lot of things. Well, I'm specifically referring to an era where people had very limited resources and mainly learned on their own and through community. And the result of that is that everyone will have their own distinct style while sharing a common language. Just like someone in a country or in a city may all speak the same language, but people will have their individual personalities. So... This is the exact same thing with uh, with jazz, at least this era of jazz. Nowadays, when you go to a lot of music schools, they teach you a system that was invented after the height of popularity of this music. And the result of which is another style. And I'm not here to say one is better than the other, but if you're interested in like bebop or this older style, maybe you want to hear what i want to say because in the music schools they will teach you um, these scales these arpeggios enclosures all these things that while on the surface are technically not wrong it's actually not how a lot of these musicians were thinking and especially the whole chord scale thing uh and so for today's video i'm taking a kind of a frankenstein version of a george benson solo um called uh, a song called clockwise that he recorded when he was very, very, very young, one of his first uh, recordings. And there are two takes, and I'm mixing ideas from both takes. Kind of, I notice a lot of conceptually uh, repetitive material in the in that solo. And this is a great example of a solo that is quote unquote theoretically wrong according to music school standards, but. That is the sound that you get. That is the George Benson sound. One of the George Benson sounds, at least the early George Benson sound. And when when you listen to music, uh, when you figure out music from other players from that era, not 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, you will notice a lot of similarities, not necessarily in terms of sound, but in terms of approach. That it's a lot less about scales, a lot less about... Uh, systematic ways of practicing arpeggios but about vocabulary and about understanding where the harmony is going that is the the key to making this sound the way it sounds now if you want another sound of course then you go for the other method but we're i'm talking about something relatively specific here so it's over a blues and there are a few interesting things to say here right off the bat 
Because yet another thing that I've seen a lot from people from the academic background, it seems like I'm knocking on people who are coming from an academic background, but that's that's not the case. I actually appreciate them very, very much. But but I cannot deny that I see this a lot. When people say, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to teach you the blues. First, you're going to learn your mixolydian scale and you're going to master your dominant seventh chords. Again, theoretically, technically not wrong, but I made a video about this last year. But, you know, if we're going to talk about the blues before talking about scales and whatnot, why not talk about the history? Why not talk about the blues, the vocabulary? You know, a lot of it is based on pentatonics, not just pentatonics. Watch that video. But, you know, the, the actual language instead of practicing, you know, G7, G mixolydian, C mixolydian, or G arpeggio. Does this sound like blues to you? Or does this sound like blues? You let me know. <laughs> the whole thing about the blues is that it is already one of the earliest examples of quote-unquote playing theoretically wrong. Because traditionally speaking, when you're in the key, let's say of G, G major, the first chord traditionally is supposed to be a major chord, G major scale. It shouldn't be a chord that has the, the seventh in it. So in, in those days, the accompanists may be playing a G triad, but in the melody, they might be singing like a melody that emphasizes this note. So that already is quote unquote wrong. But this, these wrong notes are what make the blues what they are. So instead of talking about rules, it's better to talk about trends. What were the trends that make a style what, what it is? There is quite a lot to unpack in this solo. So this is not George's solo note for note. It's many ideas, concepts, and phrases mixed together that I, uh, that I kind of combined together, hopefully into something relatively coherent. And I like to do this for myself because for me, it's not about copying 100% exactly what the artist does. It depends on what your intent is. If you want to get into the feel and the, the whole tone, okay, then th that's, that's a nice exercise in itself. But for me, in this case, it's about absorbing concepts and vocabulary, in which case it's not too important. It's not so important for me to be 100% exactly the way the artist played. Like I said, there's a lot of things to say here. First of all, I'm greatly reminded of something that Dan Wilson told me not so long ago. You should check out In the Style of Dan Wilson on DC Music School. But um, I've said this in previous videos, but we'd be recording a take on a tune. And I'd ask him, all right, how'd you feel about that? You want to do another take? He'd be like, you know, I'm quite satisfied with it. You know, there were some mistakes, whatever. It's human. And that's a very, very powerful statement. And I say this because in this solo, uh, I've noticed I didn't copy those errors, but in errors, quote unquote. But George Benson plays some things that are not necessarily theoretically correct. But you know what? When you listen to it, it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound terrible. It's not like oh, he played something wrong. No, it's um, well, it doesn't sound bad because one, it's still more or less in the key, and. He plays in such in a confident way. He just continues. He doesn't make in his playing. He doesn't show that he made a mistake. So there's one particular instance where over the first four bars, the G chord going to the C chord, he uh, he came early. George Benson came early, and um, so he plays some kind of idea that leads to a C7. But the C7 chord, yeah, he plays the C7 chord two bars early. But you know what? He doesn't he doesn't care. He continues his idea, and uh, unless you you have super good ears or you you transcribe it like I did, you probably wouldn't notice that it was quote unquote a mistake. And there are lots of little instances like this. Keep in mind, it's, the tempo is pretty fast, and he's very young and he's improvising all this. It's it's an amazing solo. So that's something to keep in mind uh, about playing jazz. I've said this in previous weeks. Where sometimes people will be trans uh, will be transcribing solos from legendary players, and then they go online or they go to the teacher. Oh, what is this? What is this musician thinking here? Uh, it's so crazy. I don't understand. 
well, maybe your favorite artist is not thinking anything. Maybe they're just, they had something and they, they went for it. It didn't really matter if it worked or didn't. It happened and they were happy enough with it that they kept the take as it is. And this is a lot, lot more common than you might expect when you transcribe a lot of these uh, players. As opposed to a lot of players nowadays who, who are what I call super soldiers. They're trained to play in, all, in a very, well, quote-unquote, theoretically perfect way. Uh, again, not knocking that, but I'm just saying that it's a myth that every single jazz solo out there is 100% theoretically perfect. It's just not true at all. So that's another thing. When you're listening to your favorite artists and you're trying to learn from them, you have to decide what you want to take from them. Do you want to copy the mistakes? Well, you have to figure out, you have to realize that they were mistakes. And usually I, I, I tend to not take the quote-unquote mistakes or I modify things to make them quote-unquote right. Because of course, when you're practicing and when, when you're... It's not an excuse to make a lot of mistakes. I'm just saying that if a mistake is going to happen, so be it. But of course, do your best to play as well as possible. So that's what I do when I'm practicing. I try to play as well as possible. But when the real playing situation happens, whatever happens, happens. So in this video, I want to show you some ideas, some licks, and some concepts. So the first uh, phrase that I played is my own, it's kind of, imp it's improvised. So it's, it's a mix of improvisation, very little improvisation, and then a mix of a lot of George Benson's ideas. I start out with this phrase uh, that works very nicely over the first, first few chords. Okay, actually I improvised the phrase, I don't remember exactly what I did, but I think it was something like this. And you'll have all of this transcribed so you can check it out. This is over a G7 chord, or a G major chord if you want. G7, going to C7, back to G7. So it's just playing the blues over this. So one thing you can do is if you're in another song, let's say, it doesn't have to be a blues, it's let's say in the key of B flat, and you're in a uh, B flat cut for a long time, let's say playing Honeysuckle Rose. And then here. See, that's a phrase that you can plug and play. So you can take the idea as it is, or you can just take the concept, be inspired by the, the sound of this blues, okay? And then, uh, that's where I start taking ideas from George Benson. He's, knows he, he knows he has to go to a C7, so he has this idea based off this chord. It's a C7. So, this is coming from the altered sound. Some people will call this playing A flat minor 6 over G7. I see it as G7, but just another thing you can think about. So then, uh, if you know the sound of this. You can take the whole thing. This is not a theory course and it's not a scale course. But you see, when a lot of people in those days are using the altered sound, they are using it uh, in a very specific way. It's not about taking the scale and going up and down. It's using it often in, in this kind of way. Often in descending fashion. That's what's happening here. So because actually the scale, if you play the actual scale, it's missing this note. No, George and like a lot of jazz musicians, they use the sound this way. Okay? And then another pentatonic idea. Uh, how's it go? And that's pretty cool, from C7 to G. And the phrasing is connect connecting from the C7 to the G chord. C7, G, and then you have this scalar pattern, and then leads to this note here, it's an A minor chord. So George Benson is improvising this and it, he's a little bit, uh, 
I hope it's okay to say this, a little bit sloppy. There's some missed notes, but I filled in the blanks on it because like I said, my goal here is not to copy every single nuance. It's just take the idea. And this is a very typical idea. So it starts with this arpeggio. And you might think, oh, it's an E minor 7 arpeggio. Technically, yes, but it's actually the upper structure of A minor. If you play an A minor in thirds, that's what it is. So this is a very, very typical sound in, in that era of jazz. So it starts with an E minor, what looks like an E minor arpeggio, but it's just the upper triad, upper structure, sorry. And then this, what looks like a C major 7, but it's the same thing, upper structure. And then he switches to the altered sound. And resolves here, G. So it's a, this is a cool lick in its own. So if you're playing, you're in the key of C and B flat, say so you're playing uh, autumn leaves. Three, four. There we go. So it's a lick, an idea, a concept. Combining the upper structure of uh, the two chord and then connecting through voice leading to the altered sound. And the altered sound here in this position is this chord. Try to visualize this chord. So the next idea is not a George Benson phrase. It's, not, it's my own phrase, kind of semi-improvised. It's based on the concept, on a concept that uh, George played here. George's original phrase was this. That was his original phrase. That's the one where he came early. But I, don't, I didn't want to come early, so I changed a few things. So what is the concept? So it's over the, the first four bars of uh, the blues. So actually, one thing to say about the blues, tradition, uh, not traditional, nowadays when you, go to the music, when you go to music school and you learn, let's say, a blues in G, they're going to teach you G, first bar, second bar, C7, next bar, G7. That's but one possibility. And one, one thing you have to know is that the second, the first C7, the second bar, is actually a passing chord. It's not necessarily important. And if you listen to a lot of recordings from the past, you'll notice that sometimes they play it, sometimes they don't, from one chorus to another. It's not necessarily consistent. And if I'm not mistaken, that seems to be the case in these recordings of Clockwise by George Benson. Sometimes I hear the organ maybe playing, sometimes I hear George playing, or different things. They're doing different, all, lots of, all sorts of different things. But it's not set in stone that it has to be seven, C7. And I say this because a lot of music students then they'll think, okay, on the second bar, I always have to nail that C7 chord. You could, but you don't necessarily have to. And that's exactly what George Benson is doing quite often in this solo. He just completely ignores the second bar, the C7. He just thinks really in terms of G. So what he's doing is what looks like an F major 7 arpeggio. But what this is would be the upper extension of D minor. But wait, D minor is essentially G sus. Blah. So you're basically playing, your, in, in your improvisation, you're superimposing this sound G sus over a G7 chord. And the wrong note is the C natural. If you go to music school, if you go to Berkeley, I think they teach that as an avoid note. The note C is an avoid note on a G chord. But yet, this is one of the typical sounds of that style of the 40s, even the 30s, 30s, 40s, uh, well, mainly 40s, 50s, 60s. This is an extremely typical sound. Uh, West Montgomery used this sound a lot as well. It's quote unquote wrong, but that's what creates this, this style, this trend. So I created this long F phrase. I think it, I, did, I, I started off the way he did, and I kind of improvised it, so. long F chord. By the way, me personally, when I play this, I'm not thinking F major 7 in my head. I'm still thinking G7. Actually, in my head, because I have so much experience doing this, I see G7, F major, D minor as being the exact same thing. It's hard to explain, but I just see them all as one. 
as the same person but wearing different clothes if that helps it's like when you see someone you don't necessarily stop rec recognizing them because they put on a hat or something you still recognize them and it's the same for me for me this is like a g7 but wearing a different you know a hat or whatever okay but th that's just me anyway <clears throat> so if you go check out <clears throat> my course on sound slice on how to build a bebop lines so you can I'll, I'll teach you how to build a lot of lines that are emphasizing these kinds of chords. So you can do like... And you can play that over G7. And if you check out my harmony courses, it talks about all these different substitutions. About uh, what I call harmonic direction. How to understand where the chord progressions are going. So then you can superimpose different sounds to sound in a particular style okay so i do this whole thing uh what was the phrase and here i switch to g7 i actually switch to a g7 sound to lead to the c7 and then i play george the solo and this is very very interesting this is another instance of him playing quote unquote wrong but playing according to the the principles of harmonic direction that I just talked about earlier. Okay, so over the C7 chord, that's a little bluesy idea that works. But then, here, he's on the second bar of the C7, he switches to C minor 7. And why is this? This is voice leading. to a lot of very very old blues you actually hear this sound as well as you can hear this in Charlie Christian's music you can hear the rhythm playing playing a C chord for two bars but Charlie Christian in his improvisation doing C major to C minor well assuming with the key of G back to G in fact I did a video about this last summer you can check that out some Charlie Christian stuff so see how they were all connected I mean George was a huge fan of Charlie Christian Okay, but um, the way George interpreted the sound is a little bit, quote unquote, more sophisticated because he's using uh, the, the sounds of his era where you have this kind of line. That was not a typical line in the days of Charlie Christian. So, that brings us back to G. And it's very interesting. This is an idea that Django used a lot. I don't know if he got, he got it from Django. I wouldn't, I'm, not also, I'm also not saying that Django invented this, but this, it does this. Because it brings us back to G, but George is thinking B minor 7. And leads us to an E7 flat 9. This E7 chord in the blues is something that they will teach you as well in music school. But it is also an optional chord. Sometimes George isn't playing. In the first chorus that I played, George isn't doing it. He completely ignores the E7 chord because it's not an important chord. These are all passing chords. There are so many passing chords available to you. I suggest you check out my harmony course. It's really, really, really good. Please support me. Uh, then he has this idea. We can say this kind of comes from E7 alter, but there are not enough notes to really know exactly what he was thinking. But leads me to the next idea. So the E7 is a passing chord, brings us to this A minor chord. And we have this phrase. Nice phrase. Just this. Again, these are all the upper extensions of A minor to D7. So this in itself is a nice phrase. Use this over other songs. Autumn leaves. One, two, three, four. Third chorus, I took ideas from Benson but I didn't play exactly the way he did. He has this another bluesy idea. Let's say you're in the, well, you're in the key of G. Again. And what's pretty cool about this is that it's the beat one is here. This note. So check out my course on phrasing as well. It's anticipating bar one and four and one. It's not always starting on beat one. So. Let's say you're playing Honeysuckle Rose. Three, four, and one. See? Can you use 
recycle ideas, try them on different songs, in different situations. Uh, different songs, but the same situation, same chord progression. Okay, and then I did some, my own little thing. And then what George does in this solo, he's playing over the C7 chord, he's playing G minor 7. I do it like this. You can also use this fingering. But I think I like this finger. It sounds, feels musical to me. <laughs> Why does that work? It's the same principle. It's the same principles as, as I said, uh, as um, the idea of playing F over G7. So G minor is also B flat major 7. So C7. See, it's another wrong idea, but that's that's the style. So what we've seen here is on the C7 chord, of course you can play some kind of C idea, but going back to the G chord, in one chorus, George played a C minor, but in this chorus, he's playing this B flat or G minor idea. And then I do a little blues thing. And then here's another thing. Over the 2 5 1, George is thinking this A minor. Well, this is my own phrase. Like, I, I take the concept and I improvised around it. And then here, so this is a pattern that George plays, and it's very interesting. This is one. Of, this is a perfect uh, example of why, if you're interested in this style, you shouldn't be stringing, uh, <laughs> stringing. You shouldn't be thinking in terms of chord scales or whatnot. You should be thinking in terms of chord tones, and how to voice lead, because what he does is this. Starts off ascending with a kind of C minor 7 arpeggio, C minor 9 arpeggio if you want even. But descending switches to this, I guess, what we would call melodic minor. So he's just combining, and this is very typical of Charlie Parker, of Django Reinhardt, of a lot of players. It's not, it's about knowing how to decorate the chords and less about sticking to one scale and going up and down the scale. There's a, there's a kind of a, a how do you say, there's a f natural flow to the way they go in and out of chord tones that are belonging to different scales. But they're not thinking in terms of scales, they're just really thinking in terms of chord decoration. So at one moment it's a C minor 7, the next moment it's a C minor major 7. But it all, the, the one thing you have to understand is that oh, this all falls in the category of C minor. So over a D7, George is superimposing C minor, which is a very typical sound in the old days, something that even Louis Armstrong did, but not in that way. Louis Armstrong would probably have done something like... Uh... Okay. And then the final chorus is taken from this other take, the first take, the one that got released officially and it's much faster. And it's just one entire chorus of quote unquote missing the changes, just playing bluesy ideas. I don't know what happened there, but the camera shut off on its own, so I hope this works. Okay, so you have this pedal idea and then basically a bluesy idea, just like pentatonic and blues. entire course of ignoring quote unquote the changes by just playing bluesy ideas and it's beautiful so I thought I would include it. So there we go. It's another solo where we can take different ideas from concepts, definitely a lot of concepts but concrete licks. So have fun with this one. Uh, please leave a comment and if you have a little bit of money to spare you can buy something, some of my courses or something, my music on Bandcamp. Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.